get into Ezra. We're going to be in Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9. Nobody has anything you'd like to share? Y'all are quiet. I mean, that means y'all are tired. I think that's what that means. Y'all are tired. All right. Ezra chapter 9. We already went through the first five verses. We got to verse 6 in Ezra chapter 9. And uh, we're going to look at Ezra's prayer. So Ezra, uh, he, uh, he's been uh, met with a serious situation. He, he went down to Jerusalem to help educate the people in God's laws. And he found out that the people were living in sin. So now, how is he going to deal with that? That's what we're going to look at this morning. But before we do that, let's pray again and just ask God to bless this word. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your many blessings, Lord. I pray that you would be with all of the requests that have been mentioned, uh, Lord, that you would be with each and every need. We pray for the young people in their classes today, Lord, and uh, you would just uh, teach them and help them guide their teachers, Lord. I pray for the pastor and the message that he brings in the following service, Lord. I just pray that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit, that you would give him the words to say, Lord, that you would touch our hearts and our lives. I pray that uh, you would be with our class this morning, Lord. Give me the words to say this morning. I pray that we would learn the things you would have us to do. I pray that you would help us to be an encouragement and a blessing to the people around us, Lord, that we might be used by you to, to reach out to others and, and draw them closer to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Ezra chapter 9, let's look at verse 6. Ezra chapter 9, verse 6. This is Ezra, and uh, he is just starting. Let's, let's read verse 5 so you kind of get the initial part there. Verse 5 of Ezra chapter 9. It says, and at the evening sacrifice, I rose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass has grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. And now, for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape, and to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia, to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. All right, let's stop there. When we first met Ezra, uh, he had prepared himself to go down to Jerusalem to teach the Bible, basically, to teach God's laws. Now, he didn't have the New Testament. All he had was Moses' law but, uh, and, and some of the other books I imagine he had, you know, maybe uh, Joshua and Judges, some of those previous books before his time. And uh, he had prepared himself to go and teach the Bible to the people at Jerusalem. And, uh, and the, the neat thing for him is, is he, this is a new temple. They had just built the temple. In fact, in the first part of Ezra, we saw that, where they got the temple uh, finished. Now, they had a lot of controversy and, and, and problems with uh, adversaries who wanted to stop them from building the temple but they were able to get it built. And so when Ezra prepared himself to go down, he not only made preparation himself to go down, but he had the full support of his king, of, king, of the king of Persia, King Artaxerxes. 
In fact, the king of Persia told him, he said, I'm going to give you whatever you need. He said, if you need to help on the other side of the river, I'll give you the help on the other side of the river. He said, uh, you know, whatever you need. And he, and he laid out a list for him. He said, you know, this is all what we're going to provide for you. In fact, the king even gave him some, some offerings for him to give to the temple. So basically, the king was offering to God uh, through Ezra. He was giving an offering of, of, uh, of some of the things that they would offer there at the temple. Um, many uh, Jews also traveled with Ezra. They, um, the king said, anybody who wants to go is free to go. And that was important because these Jews had been in captivity. They had been in bondage. They had been captured by the Babylonians. Now the Persians have taken over the Babylonians. And so for the king to say, hey, anybody who wants to go is free to go, uh, that just kind of put his stamp on of approval on it. said, y'all are welcome to go down to Jerusalem. Y'all are welcome to go and, you know, um, set up camp down there and, and live your lives down there. Basically, you're welcome to move to your home place, to Jerusalem. I, was, I, I saw on the news the other day um, that there's many Jews today that are moving over to Israel. Uh, many places in the world that Jews are hated. And so they're, they're moving back to Israel because they uh, have protection. They, they know that the people there are going to fight for them. They're going to take care of them. And so there's many Jews today going to Jerusalem. So that's... That's what's happening is Ezra, he's going to Jerusalem, and as many people as wanted to go with him are welcome to go. And, uh, but there was one group of people that did not go, or at least they, at first they did not go, and that was the Levites. And the Levites were needed in the temple. They needed somebody to help work in the temple. And so uh, Ezra went, and he sent back a messenger to say, hey, is anybody willing to come. Uh, send me a Levite. Send me a Levite family that can come and help in the temple work. And so they found someone that was willing to go and do the work. And uh, when they got to the river, they fasted and they prayed. And the reason they fasted and prayed was because they wanted God's protection. Um, and it says specifically that he, was, he did not want to ask the king for protection. And the reason he did not want to ask the king for protection was because the king, he had told the king, God is against those that are against God. And he told the king, God is for those who are for God. And so he did not want the king to think that God needed his help. He wanted the king to know that God could protect him. So he did not ask the king for soldiers or any protection. And we talked about that, and we talked about how you know, how, how would we have done, handled that? I think a lot of us would be like, well, let's do the smart thing. Let's ask the king to send us soldiers so we'll be protected. But Ezra was worried about the king's perception of God. Um, and so they prayed, they fasted, and then they made their journey. And um, they divided the treasures among the chief priests so that they would, those uh, vessels, those expensive items that they were carrying so they would be protected and they went down to Jerusalem and it took four months to make that journey down to Jerusalem. And so it's not like you just get in your car and drive, you know, a couple of days. This was four month long journey. So it was a pretty big deal. And when they got to Jerusalem, the Bible says they furthered the people in the house of God. And the last time we met, um, we met, we saw Ezra got down there to Jerusalem, and the people came to Ezra and said, we've got a problem. And he said, they said, the problem is, is that the people have been marrying wives out of the heathen people that they are not allowed to marry. Uh, there were specific groups of people, God says, don't marry them. Uh, it was the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Jebusites. But, and uh, some of the other ones, parasites. Those specific people, God says, do not marry. And yet they were marrying them anyway. And so we talked about that uh, last time.
So now when we look here at Ezra's prayer, uh, we see that Ezra says in verse 6, he says, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head. Our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. So Ezra is totally ashamed and totally embarrassed. And you know, I look at that, and you probably look at that, and you say, well, Ezra didn't do it. <laughs> right? Don't y'all don't think that? I mean, he didn't do it. He wasn't guilty. It was his people that were guilty. And, uh, but I think that just speaks to the, the fact that we need to be interceding on each other's behalf. We need to be reaching out on other people's behalf. Not just focused on ourselves, but when we see someone else fall into sin, we need to realize that we need to be reaching out to God for them. And say, God, could you please help them in their life? Um, and so we should always be ashamed of sin, whether it's our sin, maybe there's something going on in the church that's sin, we need to be ashamed of that. Maybe there's something that's in our family that's sin. We should be ashamed of that. Maybe it's our nation. How many of you know our nation has a lot of sin in our nation? Uh, we need to be ashamed of that and going to God and saying, God, please intercede, help in this situation. And, um, and so that's what we see Ezra doing. He is basically interceding for his people. And the reason is because sin is hurtful. Sin is damaging. Sin causes a lot of problems. And that's why God says, don't do those things. And uh, that's why Ezra is so upset. Verse, nine, uh, verse 7, excuse me. He says, since the days of our fathers have we been in great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword to captivity, to a spoil, and to confusion of face as it is this as it is this day. So there he's saying, we've already been, we are already being judged for our sin. We are already being punished. So if we're already being punished, why are we sinning again? Why are we doing things that would hurt God again? Um, that is what Ezra's praying. And that's what I think, you know, if God's already judging you in your life, should we not think twice before sinning again? And uh, that's what Ezra's saying. We're already in trouble for our sin, but now we're sinning again. Verse 8, uh, he says this, he says, And now for a little space grace hath been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. So there in verse 8 he's saying God has given us grace. He says God is being good to us. You know what has God done for them? They've been in captivity and God brought them out of captivity down to Jerusalem. And God says here you go. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you some freedom. I've given you some, some space where you can worship me and where you can do your own thing and you can have some freedom and you can worship God as you please. The kings are being good to you. And yet now they're living in sin. So how many of you know, how many of you, when somebody's mean to you and you're good to them and then they're continually mean to you, even though you're trying to be good to them. How many of you get upset about that? I mean, you know, that's like, I know for me that's really aggravating. I mean, when you try to be good to someone and they continually, they, they don't care about you or whatever, or they continually lash out at you. It's like, look, I'm, I'm trying to be nice here. What, what's the deal? You know, that's what Ezra's concerned about. He's saying, God, you're being good to us and we're being mean to you. We're, you're, you're reaching out to us and giving us a little reviving here where we can go back to our land, where we can build our temple. And yet we're basically spitting in your face by marrying these wives that we're not supposed to be married. And um, 
So God is kind to them. And uh, we also see in the last part of verse 9, let's see.
And we talked about that last time. Um, but God had warned these that these evil people would lead them away from him. He had warned that if they got to be marrying these wicked people, that they were going to turn their hearts to idolatry. And in fact, that happened. We saw that in the book of Second Chronicles, where they turned their hearts to idolatry. They turned their hearts away from God. You know that happens all the time. I mean, if you know, in our day, people will get to be best friends with wicked people. And then what happens? They end up being convinced that what they're doing is bad. <coughs> and they end up being convinced that they can go and do those wicked, same wicked things. That's why you've got to be careful about who we become best friends with. And that's what Ezra is saying. God, you told us not to marry these people, and yet we did it anyway. And then he says in verse 13, look at verse 13, he says, And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds, and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, has punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and has given us such deliverance as this, should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldst not thou be angry with us till thou hadst consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped, as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespass, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. And so basically, that's where he's saying, hey God, we are trampling all of your grace. We are doing things to you when you are being, we are being mean to you, basically, when you have been good to us. And, uh, you know, um, I think that we're the same way. So we're not, like I said, when we're nice to someone and they're mean to us, what do you want to do? I know what you want to do. You want to throw dirt at them, don't you? <laughs> um, and God's the same way. And uh, if, if God's been good to us, we trample his grace, uh, God can get angry with us. In fact, Jude chapter 1 verse 4 warns us about that. It says, there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. There Jude warns us that there's going to be evil people in the last days that turn God's grace what that means is if they're going to say, well, God's good to me, so I can just go and do whatever I want. God's going to forgive me for anything I do. I can just go live how I want. And that's what Jude warns about. He says, these are evil people. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, the Bible says, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and done despite unto the spirit of grace. There in Hebrews he warns, you know, um, how much do you think God's going to punish someone who basically takes the Son of God and trains him? And, uh, you, know, so, you know, if we just think we can live and sin however we want and God's grace is going to cover all of that, we need to think again, because that's taking advantage of God's grace, and God's not going to be happy with that. And that is why Ezra is so concerned. He's concerned because God's being good to them, and they are living in sin. And uh, Ezra's just imagining here, we are going to be consumed by God because of what we're doing. And, uh, well, in chapter 10... Ezra's praying for all these people. And what do the people do? We see that in verse in chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children. For the people wept very sore. So we see here, Ezra's praying. And he's weeping, and he's crying, and he's calling out to God. And what do all the people do? They start dabbing around. 
It's like God started a revival. And all Israel had to do was just pray. He prayed, he sought the Lord, and the people started gathering. And you know, I, I dare say that if we want to see God work, what we need to do is we need to start praying. As we start praying, we'll see God work. As we start looking to the Lord and saying, God, please help us. Please work in this situation. Please help this situation. That's when God really starts doing things. You know, Ezra didn't have to lift a finger really to, to, to any of the people. All he did was went to the temple and prayed and went before God, and God started answering his prayer. And uh, so as they began to gather around, one man has an idea. We see that in verse 2. It says, And Shechaniah, the son of Jehu, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God, and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now... There is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives, and such as are one of them, according to the counsel of my Lord, and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. Then arose Ezra, and made the chief priests, the Levites, and all Israel to swear that they should do according to this word. And they swear. And Ezra rose up from before the house of God and went into the chamber of Jehonan, son of Eliashib. And when he came thither, he did eat no bread nor drink water, for he mourned because of the transgression of them that had been carried away. And they made a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem unto all the children of the captivity, that they should gather themselves together unto Jerusalem. And that whosoever would not come within three days according to the counsel of the princes and the elders, all his substance should be forfeited, and himself separated from the congregation of those that had been carried away. Alright, so basically, the idea was, is we, we're going to make a covenant with God that we are going to get rid of our wives. Uh, we these wives that God said do not marry, we're going to put them away. We're going to send them back to their home land. And uh, so that was the idea he had. And, and Ezra made them promise uh, to agree to this covenant. And he says, y'all got to meet within three days. And we're going to uh, make this promise before the Lord that you're going to put away all these wives. Now I think it's important to realize that this is back in the Old Testament. This is back in the days of Ezra. Uh, this was a command God gave to the Israelites. This was not a command God gave to you today. So uh, if you go looking at your spouse's history and you find out that they were a Canaanite or a Perizzite, or, you know, they went, if you get on Ancestry.com and you look it all the way back there and find out, you know, now you're going to divorce them because, no, that's not, that's not for us today. But it was for them during this time. And uh, this was a specific command uh, for, it, for the people of Israel during the days of Ezra. And uh, so they made a promise that they were going to send these wives back home. Uh, these, they were not going to be married to these wives anymore. And uh, that was the promise they made. And in order to do this, they said it was a great rain. And that they were trembling because of the great rain and because they were scared of what God might do in judging them. And so uh, they made it a decision to for the people to come at different times. And uh, it took them three months uh, where they came and they gathered before the, people, the, the leaders there and uh, they, get, they put away their wives. And then they also offered a sacrifice for the sin. Look down at Verse 44 of Ezra chapter 10. Verse 44. It says, All these had taken strange wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. Now if you look through the rest of chapter 10 there, you'll see a list of all of them that had taken the, the strange wives, the, the wives they were not supposed to take. And, it's, and there in verse 44, it's like Ezra saying, I can't believe it did this. They not only went and married these wives, but then some of them had children by these wives. 
And um, so that was uh, basically that's all the book of business. That's what we dealt with. But we see they make it right before the Lord. And uh, they came and they they, uh, they took care of it. They offered the sacrifices to God. They sought God for forgiveness. They put away these wives and they made it right. And uh, you know that's really that's all you can do when you fall into sin when you fall into temptation. You have to go back to the Lord and say, God, I'm sorry. Let me make this right. Let me get it right before you. Uh, forgive me. Help me to do what's right from now on. And uh, that's what they did. And um, we're running out of time. I have a little bit more I'd like to say there. But, you know, I hope that we will take God seriously. I hope that we will not think, oh, God's going to be good to me. He's going to forgive me no matter what I do. No, you need to make sure that if God's good to you, you need to make sure that you're good to God. That you need to make sure that you're doing what God wants. Don't just go out here and just live however you want because God will judge. And He will judge severely if you take advantage of Him. So don't take advantage of the Lord. Uh, we, I believe next time we're going to start the book of Nehemiah. So Lord willing, we'll get into that. We may touch just a little bit on the book of Ezra just to kind of review what all we've been talking about. But, uh, Lord willing, we'll be starting with that and me and my Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for all that you do, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to take you seriously, Lord. And, uh, the things that you've commanded us, the things that you would have us to do, Lord, that those are serious, Lord, and that if we take advantage of your grace and just go out here and think that you're going to forgive us for whatever we do wrong or that we need to think again because you do judge and you can judge severely but when you don't want to you want us to do what's right and the reason Lord that you give us these laws is because they are good, they're things for our benefit and they're things for, that will help other people so help us to take your word seriously do what you have us to do Jesus.